It's his hat trick appearance today, having started off all three of our conferences. Back by popular demand for his hat trick appearance, please lift the roof in true Isle of Claim style for Mr. Ian Hughes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you doing? All right. There's a sort of a big blank space there in the middle that's a bit disconcerting because that's the space I normally talk to. Um, I'm feeling a bit punchy this morning, uh, and I apologise for that. Um, this time last week, I uh, woke up, opened the uh, curtains of my hotel room. And that was my view, uh, the beautiful beach of Sunny Isles, Miami, um, the Atlantic Ocean, 80 degree temperatures, and it was just gorgeous. This morning, I woke up with that view. <laughs> the wonderful Rico Arena. What would be, what's actually the worst part of it is that I opened my curtains and 18,000 people simultaneously booed. <laughs> so my day can only really go downhill from there. <clears throat> and so I was going to talk to you today about customer service, but seeing how badly things have started for me, I've decided to change the title of my presentation today um, and instead talk to you about something else. Um, the industry clearly is in a, a little bit of a change, and it's been amazing to see what's happened over the last 12 months. In fact, we've been tracking the price of car insurance for uh, nearly eight years now, and actually, uh, and, and we've seen a lot of changes going on. The, the fundamental thing is that we all know the price is going up, and uh, consumers are beginning to look at you and beginning to re and beginning to think that the claims industry is all about this. Computer says no, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do this. No, we don't want to pay out. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, the people answering the telephone and, and the people within the insurance industry are beginning to look at consumers and beginning to think they look a little bit like this. And that's no wonder. That's, this is how fast premiums have increased over the last few years. This is since 2007, since April 2007. Prices have gone up over 110% across the whole of the market. When we looked at, that's just for new business prices, we've also been tracking renewal premiums as well. And you can see that renewal premiums have been going up across that time. So consumers have seen the price of their insurance go up dramatically. When it comes to under 25s, they've been seeing their prices go up even more than the general market. So there's been this huge shift towards an increase in premiums and consumers are beginning to get a little bit jaded about this. So I wanted to, for today's presentation, I wanted to have some entirely new and unique uh, material for you, stuff that nobody's ever seen before. So we started doing some research back last summer into consumers' attitudes towards claims and consumers' attitudes towards insurance in general. Now the good news is that um, I'm going to show you a load of numbers and a load of stats. You don't have to write any of that stuff down. We've actually produced a white paper to go with today, and all the numbers and stats that you're about to see are in the white paper. Just whip along and see uh, Harriet or one of the team of consumer intelligence and just pick up a copy and you can take it away and plagiarise at will. If you really don't like statistics, then go along and pick up one of these and take that home. Um, or take both. So, why do consumers think that prices have been going up? Well, I think the good news is that consumers are actually getting the message. We asked them what they think are the contributory factors of price increases. 24% said fraudulent claims, 24% said personal injury claims, 22% said uninsured drivers, and the good news for insurers is that only 13% are actually blaming insurers for trying to want to make more profit. I think that's, that's actually quite good news because it means the, the message is getting out. Yes, your premium's going up, but it's not because the industry's ripping you off, it's because there's this entire culture that's going on. But as a result of that, 86.5% of consumers that we talk to, and we talk to thousands of consumers every month, are shopping around at Renewal. So it's causing people to want to think about changing when they see the price go up. Um, and what they're, trying, what they're trying to do is to get that price down as low as possible. And in order to do that, they're being economical with the truth. 
So, for instance, we asked people what they thought would be acceptable. And 60% uh, of consumers said it would be okay to adjust the information that they gave in a quote in order to try and get the premium down a little bit. So, you know, it's kind of a, just playing with it a little bit. It's no big deal, is it? 43% of people said it would be okay to exaggerate the value of items lost or stolen to increase the amount of money claimed. They could think of a circumstance. So what we're talking about here is people saying, I can think of a circumstance where it would be all right. We all know it's not okay. But we're just checking in with consumers as to what they think. And then finally, 35% of consumers said it would be okay to exaggerate a, an injury claim in order to try and increase the amount of money they were going to get. Incidentally, about 5% of consumers said it would be okay to injure a pet in order to try and get the insurance. <laughs> there are 5% of people who you genuinely don't want to insure, folks. I can't do anything about those people. <laughs> of course, this actually, what was really, really interesting for me in this was actually what happens when you speak to people who are younger people and, and see the difference with their attitudes. So we talked to under 25s. In their case, 69% of them thought it was okay to just adjust some stuff in order to try and bring the premiums down a bit. 58% of the people thought it was okay to slightly exaggerate a claim in order to, to push the amount up. And 54%, which is a huge jump from the 35%, said they thought it would be okay uh, to exaggerate an injury in order to increase the value of a claim. That is not a good way for tomorrow's generation of insurance buyers to be thinking about you and about this industry. It's not a good way to be bringing up and to be thinking about planning for the future. So, the insurance industry obviously is responding to this in various different ways, and we've, we've picked up two distinct trends over the last uh, two years. The first one was around telematics, and the second one is about the use of third-party data. And we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into those two to see what consumers' opinions were around that. We sort of know the industry's opinion, and, and we'll find out more of that today. We wanted to know what consumers think about these two items. So the first one was telematics. And so we talked to consumers about whether they'd like to have a black box fitted in their car uh, at their next renewal in order to help try, try and drive down the premium. So, uh, we've been doing this research now, surveying uh, thousands of people every month since August of last year, and the results are that uh, most people say no. So this in research terms is what's called a no-brainer, and at this point you stop doing research. But I actually don't believe, and it was interesting, Mike was talking about this earlier on, uh, about market research, I actually don't believe that consumers necessarily understand the question or the issue. So we have started to approach it from a slightly different direction. We said, what if your car already had a box fitted in it? And you had a really clever car that was capable of doing clever things, and it's got this box in it. What sort of things would you like your car to do for you? So, for instance, we asked them, if your car knew where you were going to, what if it was to tell you where the cheapest place to buy petrol was en route? And 73% of people said, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. I like that. We asked them, what they thought about uh, shops and places that had offers en route. 24% of people thought that was all right. And uh, automatically update your Facebook as to where you are. Well, we didn't quite get as many people like that one. Um, in fact, the number's so small that we didn't have to know. Like this, I'm at the Rico Arena. Um, so, uh, so obviously there are some benefits and some values that consumers can get from having boxes in their cars. Whether they proactively go get them fitted or whether the box is pre-fitted when they buy the car. So we dug a little bit deeper into it. Now this, at this point in time we realised that actually this is just an issue about perception for consumers in terms of whether they fit it or whether it's fitted. So we carried on a little bit further. This piece of work is called Your Clever Car um, and it's in, the, uh, it's in the, the white paper. So we asked them what other things we, that this box could do for you. Uh, so the first one was uh, and we asked them to, to rate on a scale between one, not useful and not acceptable, and five, really useful and I'd really like that for each one of the following items. The first one is uh, drive for you. So anything lower than a three, consumer said no. Okay, so they don't want 
the car to drive for them. Which I thought was actually quite a good idea. But there you go. Um, second one, tell your employer about how you drive. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because we actually tr we tried to find out, we, we talked to people who actually were company car drivers. So we're going to come back to that one in a minute. The third one was tell police authorities if you drive illegally. <laughs> Not too keen on that one either. And then the next one was tell your insurance company uh, and change the cost of your insurance. And whilst they are actually okay about that in general, Still, it's only just slightly up from getting the police to arrest you. <laughs> and then the rest of them flow on from there, tell you how, how other people who drive your car drive it uh, whilst, whilst you're not in it, um, and then it goes forward from there. Uh, the number one thing that, of course, consumers want the car to do, and this is kind of interesting if you're in the telematics business in terms of how you sell your proposition, the number one thing they want it to do is to track your car if it's stolen, uh, number two thing was automatically call the insurance uh, to the emergency services if I have an accident. And the number three thing was record the details if you ever have an accident. And I know a lot of the telematics products do that. So clearly you can see how consumers uh, are viewing that kind of stuff. So, so this was good. So let's just dig a little bit deeper into... Um, let's not go back to the presentation. A um, little bit deeper into that. So actually... If you look at track your car that's stolen, 76% of people actually said not only was that very useful, but that was actually a really good idea and something they wanted to have. So that's, so that's good news. And in fact, very few people, almost nobody said not useful and not acceptable. When it came to uh, tell your insurance company about your driving and change your cost of insurance down or up, and we did ask it in the case, that case down first and then up second, um, actually, you can see that 35% of people said that was useful, and 19.5% of people said that would be very, very useful for them. And actually, it's only 11% of people who said not useful and not acceptable. So actually, telematics on the whole, people aren't thinking about it, but when you actually put it to them in a slightly different way, they're up for it, and I think it's quite a good idea. Um, so then, um, we asked them about who should actually have, who should own that data, who should be the person who owns the data, and 64% of people said they thought that the registered owner of the vehicle should, have, should be the owner of that data. 31% uh, of the people said that I should own my data, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, and then the insurance company uh, was at 3%. So that's a little bit of a perception gap that needs to be overcome there. Uh, clearly uh, not the insurance company, not the police, not the garage or the dealership, not the manufacturer, not the government or anybody else. So that's kind of, uh, that's about who owns it, which is different from who should have access to it. So we then asked them who should have access to that data, uh, and obviously 76% of people agreed that the registered owner should have access to it, 51% of people said I should have access to it, and 34.9% of people said the insurance company should have access to it. Now don't forget, we're actually asking people about a car that's already got the box fitted in it. Not one that they've actually gone and proactively sought to have the box fitted. So that was kind of interesting, and then you can see that uh, actually 25% of people said it would be okay for the police to have access to that information as well. Um, we asked kids uh, who don't, whose parents pay for their insurance whether they thought their parents should have access to this information. 72% uh, of people said yes. These are the kids whose parents pay for the insurance. We asked company car drivers, whose companies pay for the insurance, uh, whether they thought the company should have access to the information. Anybody want to guess? Sixty percent of people said yes. Forty percent of people said no. Uh, it is actually—it's not just ten people that responded. It is a statistically valid sample. It just happens to be round numbers. Um, <clears throat> And then we were kind of interested, and we dug a little bit deeper there, and we asked, you know, so if your company was to find out that if you were driving badly in their car that they're insuring, what do you think they should do about it? So 68% of people said that they should ask you to drive better, as though that's going to happen. 28% uh, of people said take disciplinary action, which is sort of interesting, uh, and uh, very few people said take the car away. So there's some interesting stuff going on there with people's uh, consumers' views and opinions about what should go on with that kind of data. 
but the trouble with clever cars is, as you all know, that um, they're all different uh, and they're not compatible with each other. All the different standards that are coming out, very few of them compatible. Uh, and then so that we asked them, who do you think, who do you think consumers should be responsible for creating the standard for the data that comes out of these clever cars? Uh, should, do you think there should be a standard? 82% of people said there should be a standard. So we said, okay, that's great. So who should be responsible for making the standard up? And you can see that the insurance industry came in just after the EU. That's how popular you are. <laughs> what is not a doubt here is that consumers agree there needs to be a standard. So when there's stuff, when I read stuff about the industry agreeing that there needs to be a standard, consumers agree there needs to be a standard. What we can't agree about is who's going to create the standard. Uh, in the case of consumers, they think the people who make the cars. And don't forget, we're talking about cars that are already fitted with the boxes, as they will be in the future. So, that was sort of interesting. Uh, what's really interesting is where the insurance industry is placed within that questionnaire. Um, so then we went on to the next bit, which is third-party data. Uh, this is really exciting and interesting because this has changed a lot over the last few years as well. Um, when we started measuring uh, the use of third-party data in the price of insurance back in 2009, uh, you could see this was the number of companies, so we measured a number of different companies that we thought might be using third-party data. Uh, we've removed the names to protect the innocent. Um, and you can see that most people weren't actually using third-party data in the pricing part of the journey. This is how it was just a month ago. And this is the amount of discount that you get, on average, for having a good, well actually for having an average risk score. So you can see that the amount of companies that are using third-party or undisclosed data as part of the pricing process has changed dramatically just in the last two years. Consumers don't know this at this point in time. In fact, some people in this room may not have known this until I showed this graph. But this is a huge and growing part of the industry. It's not just during the claims process that you go off and you check whether somebody's had a claim before or check their credit score or check their other things about them and people driving around. Actually, this has been happening during the, the pricing uh, part of the uh, process as well. Uh, and, and for the pricing part of the process, clearly it happens because um, people don't necessarily know all the information they need to know. So we actually ask them, to what extent do they know stuff they need to know? Like, for instance, do you know when you last had a claim? And do you know it to such an extent that you could actually use it as part of the pricing process? I.e., can you actually tell me the year that you had a last, last had a claim? Or could you actually narrow it down for me to within three months? In a home insurance claim, 9.29% of people actually could get it right to within three months, uh, and 55% of people could not get it right to within three months. So clearly consumers just don't know, they don't care. It's kind of not something I really worry about that much. I don't know when I last had my last home insurance claim. I cannot remember my last car insurance claim. I sort of know my no claims discount, but I certainly couldn't tell you whether it was March 2003 or 2004. I'm just going to have an extra on my head. Um, motor insurance claim, 24, so you, you guys are luckier, 24% of people actually can remember it accurately, uh, whereas 36.3% of people uh, can't remember it accurately at all. And then there's some other people in the middle uh, that we won't worry about, because they don't know which way is up. Um, so there's some real use of, of being able to get that information, to be able to share that information for you guys. Uh, when it comes to thing, things like convictions, Actually, only 36% of people can actually correctly remember when they had a driving conviction. Other people, they know, I know it was 2009, but I couldn't tell you what month it was. I certainly couldn't tell you what date it was. So, we then asked, is it okay for the companies that do know that stuff to share that information? And we started with some very generic stuff. So, do you think it's okay to ask about things that, uh, things that you were thinking about buying, but you didn't buy? And 79% of people said it's not okay for companies to share information about things that I was thinking about buying, but I didn't buy. 73% um, of people said that it's not okay to share information about the fact that I'm loyal to a particular company. And 82.9% of people said it's not okay 
for you to share information about insurance claims that I didn't actually make, but I did inquire about. And by the way, this is happening right now. Just finding out to make an inquiry about a claim is registered and shared. Consumers say that's not acceptable. 82.9% of people say that's not acceptable. And they want to know, when you ask them, do you want to know about stuff? 94% of people, so the vast majority of people, want to know, want to be able to know anything you know about them. So for instance, county court judgments, 95% of people want to know if you know about their county court judgments. Any convictions that you may or may not have, 93% of people want to know that. And 93% of people want to know any information that you have about any claims that they may or may not have. This throws up a massive issue, which is going to come down the line faster than you can possibly imagine. All this sharing of third-party data amongst the industry and within the industry doesn't go down well with consumers, and it doesn't win elections. Consumer protection wins elections. Standing up in a conference and saying, it's bad for you to share my information and use it against me, wins elections. And as a result of that, things like this happen. This is the new EU data directive, verbatim, the new EU data directive. And it says that consumers should have a right to be forgotten. A reinforced right to be forgotten will help people better manage data protection risks online. People will be able to delete their data if there are no legitimate reasons for retaining it. Wherever consent is required for data to be processed, it will have to be given explicitly. I.e., you can't just have a little tick box that says, do you agree to the terms and conditions, which we know you haven't read, or by clicking this box, you've agreed to the terms and conditions. They have to explicitly accept that it's okay for you to have that data and share it <coughs> with others. Um, so this is what the EU is working on right now. Uh, and this is the stuff that wins elections. It doesn't help you when you're processing claims, and it doesn't help during the pricing process, but this is where consumers are perceiving things at this point in time. And I think it's one of the big issues that you will face over the coming 12 to 24 months. You are getting more sophisticated, but you're actually also pushing against something that consumers aren't really very happy about, and they don't know anything about, but they're going to find out about it. And when they do, the shit's going to hit the fan. That's an American. Um, so, we think uh, things have to change, and we think that we're sitting in a world where consumers' opinions and consumers' attitudes are changing and evolving dramatically, especially in relationship to, uh, to the insurance process. Uh, we have seen that um, the consumers' uh, perception of the industry has uh, been falling. This is, uh, so I, anybody familiar with the concept of net promoter score? Anybody ever get measured on net promoter score? Anybody ever wondered what the actual insurance industry's net promoter score might be? You know, you know what yours is, but what's theirs? Well, this is theirs. This is the ins car insurance industry's net promoter score, which we've been tracking for a few years. This is the average score for all insurers across the last few years, and it's been falling. So people are less satisfied with the insurance industry and have been increasingly less satisfied. Uh, and what it means is that the circle of trust between consumers and insurers is broken. They don't trust you, hence they're trying to change stuff. Um, and, and they don't trust, and you don't trust them, hence you put a black box in their car or you use their party data. Because let's face it, if they were telling the truth, or if they knew the truth, which is actually slightly more issue, uh, an issue, you wouldn't need to do it. So, we think it's time to stop the madness. We think it's time to change that. And what we're planning to do at Consumer Intelligence about this is to reinvent and, and help the industry reinvent the way it does customer satisfaction. You've seen what we're doing in terms of already talking to customers. What we're going to be doing over the next few months is beginning to change the way that insurance does works with stuff. To try and create a joined up approach to customer satisfaction because the consumer sees it as one claim. I didn't make four or five claims. I didn't want to speak to four or five different companies, six, seven, eight different companies. It's just one claim. I have one accident. 
Why am I answering 50 different customer satisfaction questionnaires and dealing with lots of different companies? It's one journey, it's one experience. I'm one person. But the industry sees it as multiple parties with multiple touch points, multiple experiences, and multiple different journeys. And we think that's not helping you understand them, and it's not helping you deal with the issues that you need to deal with, nor is it helping you drive down your costs. So the plan that we have, uh, and we'd kind of be interested uh, at this point in time to engage with you on how we best do this so we can come back next year and talk about how it's been done, is to create one satisfaction scoring method for the whole industry, including insurers, all the claims handlers, everybody, done with one voice to create one mark of excellence that everybody can trust and everybody knows because it's independently collected in terms of the data. So that nobody can argue about the data point, everybody can argue about the one thing you need to do, which is serve customers. Because at the end of the day, those are the people that pay the bills. And they're the one group of people who are becoming more and more disenfranchised by what's going on. So, that's the plan, that's why we're doing the research that we're doing, and that's what I want to come back, if I'm invited back next year, uh, to come and talk to you about is how the industry is, is mending the journey that it has with the customer, mending the relationship it has with its customer. So thank you very much, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>